What is your name, sir? Doug Webster. I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, Pleasure to be here. We talked about it earlier, but we're basically just going to, I'm going to ask some questions and then you, you just talk away. I mean, okay. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. Yeah. It's really, um, it's up to you to talk about whatever it is you want to talk about. I, some people don't want to talk about their certain things depending on the, the experiences they had. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, they want to, you know, give a real short answer and be, just move past it, which is fine with me. I, I'm right. Sit here I have no issues like that. So okay. if, if anything is of interest, I'm happy okay. to go as deep Perfect. as I can recall. Okay. Um, and what is your date of birth? August 11, 48. And where were you born? Huntington Park, California. Huntington Park? Huntington Park. Okay. Do you have any family members that are veterans? Uh, my father served in the Merchant Marine, uh, okay. but no, uh, military. no military. Okay. Anybody since? Children? Or? Uh, no, no, just uh, my last ancestor served in the Civil War, so uh, really? <laughs> as wow. a veteran in the Union Army, right? Okay. Very nice. Very nice. Um, what did you do before you, you joined the enlisted? Well, I, I uh, was a student at UCLA and uh, was uh, came in through the ROTC program, got commissioned, and then went uh, immediately into the uh, the Air Force after graduation. Was that prior to the start of the war? Uh, that was in 1972. So, you know, the okay, war was, long. you know, sort of winding down at, at that okay. point or coming close to that. Do you, do you remember your, your thoughts about the war prior to you, you, you enlisting in the military? Um, you know, I, I, I had you know, probably, I don't know if I had mixed emotions at the time or they've developed over the years. I probably have, certainly have mixed emotions now. Uh, but at the time, um, you know, I, I thought it was, uh, I believed in, uh, in what our country was doing and uh, I, I saw the threat from communism and, you know, and I saw the rationale behind uh, our, our, our being there. So uh, I was, uh, and plus I, I felt the call to service just in general. So I was glad to to have the opportunity to go into the Air Force. Right. Did you, do you remember remember hearing about the war, how it's, when it started? You have any? Did you have any thoughts about that when it, when it first started, or, or is there anything memorable about that period? I mean, it's not like the war we're in now, where 9/11 hit and it affected right, everybody. Right, Vietnam right, right. Vietnam's a little different. Now we're kind of ramped up. Yeah, I, I certainly wasn't a, a part of uh, that part of the generation that was very anti-war out there protesting and so on. I mean, I wasn't one of those gung-ho looking to go into battle, uh, but I, I did come from a somewhat conservative background, and right. uh, and so I, you know, I looked at that as one of those things that we were involved in, and uh, and uh, trusted our uh, our civilian leaders, uh, you know, to do the right thing. Right. And you you said you were ROTC, and that's and you enlisted from there. Uh, I was yes, commissioned as a second lieutenant. Uh, went initially in uh, to pilot training uh, in uh, the spring of 1972, and uh, that was at Columbus Air Force Base, Mississippi. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the need for pilots in '72 was winding down much faster than the intake had had been built up. So they had a lot more pilots coming or potential pilots going to pilot training than they had a need for pilots to fill billets. So they their uh, answer to that was to really start cranking up the the washout rate. So I ended up not completing pilot training. I, I got through about halfway through and, and joined the, the, at least half of the class that that didn't uh, finish. Those that were that washed out that were in the top group within that subgroup were given the opportunity to go to navigator training. So I did that and I went over to navigator uh, training at the Mather Air Force Base late in 72 and uh, graduated uh, in 73 and uh, got my first choice going to C-130s. So that's uh, where I, where I, I went. Uh, initially uh, to uh, uh, C-130 training at Little Rock Air Force Base and then I had uh, a couple options coming out of there uh, and I picked one to CCK Taiwan and uh, while I was uh, preparing to go to CCK that they were closing down that base and that assignment got transferred over to Clark Philippines. So that's where I spent my first operational tour was at Clark. And, you, and what was your, what, what did you do? What, you were your C-130s, right. the aircraft, what, what did you do on those? I was a navigator. You were a navigator. So, right. Okay. So I was, uh, for, I had two tours at Clark all, all told, but that first tour from 1973, December of 73, 
until uh, 77. Uh, I was uh, just a squadron navigator. And, you, and what was the mission of the squadron you were in? We, uh, well, a C-130, as you may know, is, is cargo uh, airlift. So we flew uh, throughout the, uh, the Far East. So I, I flew everywhere from uh, uh, South Korea to Australia, uh, from Thailand to Guam, and that entire geographic area. Uh, we were a primary uh, uh, point that supported uh, the operations in the Far East, in Thailand, Cambodia, and, uh, and Vietnam. And uh, it, when I was at, even though the Vietnam War had officially ended at that point in time, there was still conflict going on between the North and the South. And one of the things that we did in Vietnam was fly in uh, to pick up the peacekeeping t teams out of Saigon and fly them up, uh, ferry them up to Hanoi for discussions. So uh, I made a couple trips up to Hanoi, Hanoi during that period of time, 1974. And those all originated at Clark? Uh, they, mm. we were PCS at Clark, but we went TDY to, uh, extensively to uh, Utapau, Thailand. And so largely we were flying out of Utapau, Thailand, sometimes out of Clark, and then we would uh, occasionally go into uh, uh, um, Saigon and, and pick up folks. And, and we also uh, did a lot of uh, uh, sorties into uh, Cambodia, Phnom Penh. And how, how, how long were you there um, supporting the operations in Vietnam? Well, I was there until the, the, the very end. So uh, uh, we, I, I got there in, at Clark in December of 73, started going uh, over to uh, our TDY location uh, at Utapau, and then we would fly missions out of there various places mm -hmm. across Thailand, uh, Cambodia, and occasionally into Vietnam. And then um, continued to do that uh, when the fall of Saigon uh, became imminent. Uh, we started flying a lot of sorties out of Clark into Saigon, and that was uh, April 29th when uh, that all ended and, and our plane got hit. Were you married at the time that you were in? Actually, I got married uh, uh, two weeks prior to the, the fall of Saigon. So uh, I was flying all those sorties in there, and, and I'd only been married two weeks later. So right. I, I met my wife over in the Philippines, yes. Okay. Was she there with you when you were, when you were deployed? Yes. Um, was, yes. Wasn't unaccompanied. Okay. No, I, I went there unaccompanied, uh, served an unaccompanied tour, but uh, I, I went over there and uh, met my wife in 1974, got married a year later, and uh, changed my tour status from uh, unaccompanied to an accompanied status. How often did you did you fly when you were there routinely? Once a day, a couple times? No, there, there were uh, limits to how many hours a month you could fly, and I don't recall any longer how many hours those were, but it was relative, well, I guess it would relatively frequent, but that would depend on, on your background, what, what that means. So I, I would guess uh, typically two to three times a, a week um, it, during the, uh, uh, the fall of Saigon, it was more regular. We were flying every day, but... Uh, Prior to that, it was uh, you know maybe once, twice, occasionally three times a week. And what was life like when you weren't flying? What kind of things were you doing? A lot of uh, you know a lot of studying, trying to, to maintain uh, you know your uh, familiarity with uh, the requirements of, of the job. Other than that, it was uh, additional duty type of, of work. So uh, when you're not flying, typically is a as a, a junior officer, you're, you're doing a number of things, like you're the publications officer or you're a scheduler or those types of things. And so I did a number of those kinds of jobs uh, when I wasn't flying. And you were, what, what rank were you, you went in? I went in as a second lieutenant. And, when, and by the time you finished I was your, a first, in Vietnam, you were? I was a, if, uh, trying to remember, I was probably a new captain at that okay. point in time. You were doing just regular missions in and out, but then there came a point where you were flying missions in Saigon, correct? Right, Before right. the fall? Yeah. Uh, we, were, we had the occasional uh, missions uh, with the, the support team, uh, but when the fall came, uh, the fall of Saigon, uh, we were being used as the primary uh, source of transportation for evacuees out of Saigon. So they, they geared up a very large stream of C-130 missions operating around the clock. Uh, taking folks uh, out of Saigon, uh, largely Vietnamese, when the, when it was apparent that the, you know there was a great risk of uh, of the country falling to the the communists. Do you know how how far from the time that the Saigon fell and the last 
you know, the last chapter left, how, 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 how far out did you guys begin yeah. lifting people out? Yeah. That's, I mean, that's a good question, and I'm not, I don't honestly recall. I, I would, if I had a guess, I would guess something in the order of a couple weeks, but that's not authoritative at all, so I'm not sure. And you had, so you were flying people out of Saigon. Right. Primarily Vietnamese. Um, tell us about, about your last mission. Okay. With. Well, sure, and, and maybe I'll sort of set the stage going into that last mission. Uh, we, were, we were bringing out folks not in the normal kind of a way. The normal kind of a way anyone has ever been in a C-130 in an air show or something, you've got the troop seats along the, along, along the, uh, the back there, and it's designed to pull out 92 people, uh, fully loaded with passengers. We were pulling out 200 and sometimes more at a time. And the way we did that is we just took out all the seats, had cargo uh, platforms across the, across the floor, and every so often they'd strap a tie-down strap from one side of the aircraft to the other side. And they just told everybody to move in as far as you'd go forward to the bulkhead and sit down. And if you needed to hold on to something, uh, hold on to one of those cargo straps going away. And we got 200, we were authorized up to 200 uh, passengers that way. And I'm, I'm aware that some missions actually got out with, with more than that. And so we were doing that pretty much around the clock. They, they had a staged area at Tan Sanut uh, in the loading ramp where they had hundreds of folks waiting for these, these planes to come in at any point in time. And uh, they would open the ramp, everybody move in, uh, sit down, close the ramp, take off. We got uh, word on the 28th of April, uh, 1975, as we were waiting to, uh, to take off on a mission that some A-37s had attacked uh, the airport uh, that had been captured from uh, one of the other airfields. And so our mission was temporarily put on hold. Um, after a period of time, they released the mission. We were a part of a three ship. There were three planes uh, going in. We were the last uh, of the three. And uh, we flew over to, uh, to Saigon. Uh, and the way we'd been given reports of some uh, missile uh, activity uh, about 40 miles away, so it was definitely a, a high threat area. Uh, we flew in at uh, about 14,000 feet and did what we called uh, called a uh, uh, a landing. Uh, I forget what they what they term it, but but basically it's not the normal landing. Uh, ordinarily, and Tonsonu Tower wanted us to give us uh, vectors to an ILS uh, a landing, which is a precision uh, guided approach. Uh, and we deferred and went in overhead at 14,000 foot. And then what we, we did is, and this was standard practice over there in high threat areas, open up the paratroop doors and then the loadmaster and the navigator, and I was the navigator, uh, would go off in the back on either side and we'd put cargo tie-down straps across the doors. We'd wear a parachute just in case, you know, anyone fell out. Uh, and then you'd, you'd look out as you circled down immediately above the field looking for some spiraling lights, which indicated that a, a surface-to-air missile was coming at you. Yeah, because this is the, before the days where you had automatic detection and flare systems and so on. And we'd stand in the doorway with a, with a, a flare gun, ready to shoot it out, hopefully divert uh, the, uh, the missile. Uh, we had nothing like that, saw, so saw nothing coming up at us. So uh, shortly before uh, we circled down, shortly before landing and final turn, uh, got strapped in, seated. And we landed, and uh, our first, uh, first objective was to offload a Blue 82 bomb that we brought in. It's a 15,000-pound bomb, and it's, it's sometimes called, uh, referred to as the daisy cutter. It's no longer in the inventory, but they were dropped in Vietnam to flatten the forest and make landing, uh, helicopter landing strips. So we had brought one of those in, uh, had offloaded it uh, on one side of the airfield, and were taxing on the taxiway on the other side of the airfield back to uh, the loading area to pick up passengers. Uh, as we were on the taxiway, uh, headed towards the, uh, the loading uh, dock, loading area, at the far end of the taxiway, we saw a flash. Uh, and then every few seconds, there was a, a, a <coughs> consecutive series of, of flashes, which turned out to be explosions, walking straight down the center line of the taxiway towards us, about every 50 yards or so. And uh, the last one that we saw in front of us landed about 30 yards in front of us. And then there was another one, apparently it landed just behind us, but the shrapnel hit the uh, right wing. And fuel started coming out, the loadmaster notified the crew, uh, we shut down engines, uh, we evacuated the airplane, 
ran over to the left, uh, a ditch on the left side of the taxiway in between the taxiway and the main runway and uh, got our heads low there for a moment and uh, in the meantime uh, the, the fuel had, uh, that was coming out of the wing had spilled back to where the uh, shrapnel and the fire had landed. That caught the fuel fire and then that fire came up and, got in, and, burnt and destroyed the entire aircraft. Fortunately everybody was out at that point in time. We later found out that that, uh, that ditch and, and the, the, the ground area where we were had been mined, so we were fortunate that no one uh, stepped on a mine while we were over there. Uh, but we saw, uh, we were not too far away from the loading area, which was, had been our uh, destination, and we saw another C-130 over there. So we all uh, jogged over to that area, and it turned out that this had been another crew. I'm not sure if they landed immediately after us or immediately before us, but another crew from Clark. Uh, and we got on their airplane and, uh, and exited out. Now, I guess it may be of interest to some to note that the plane we flew was not one of our planes. It was a plane from Little Rock. Uh, I was in the 776 Tactical Airlift Squadron. We had really uh, run those planes down, and there were a lot of maintenance problems because we were flying them around the clock, and they were really worn out. Uh, the, uh, the squadron, one of the squadrons from Little Rock had brought over a, 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 a number of planes and they were preparing to fly those the next day after they got uh, in-country briefings, but we were flying it uh, that night and it, it had very, very low time on it and unfortunately it, it all got destroyed in that, uh, that event. So we, uh, we got on that airplane, we were able to taxi out. Um, and we were uh, the last fixed wing airplane out of, of Vietnam. As a result of us, uh, the plane that I flew in on, getting hit, uh, the ambassador had stopped all the, uh, the evacuation from fixed wing and then went to the uh, operation, uh, the helicopter operation evacuation. Um, I, I guess it's also probably uh, fortuitous that we made it through that whole night because uh, the co-pilot went up to the, uh, the cockpit on the takeoff roll as we were on that plane getting out and he said that uh, we went through another heavy barrage of about 40 rockets and artillery shells landing there um, on, the, on the way out. And so, but we got off with, uh, uh, thank heavens, uh, without getting hit and um, did a tight spiral uh, max uh, climb out uh, over the field and then headed back. So you, you guys were literally hanging out the side doors with flare guns. Right. Looking right. for SAMs to... Right. Did you have any... Did you ever have to deploy a flare? No, no. Uh, we I made several trips into Phnom Penh, did okay. the same same exact thing there, um, and uh, never never saw one coming up at us. But we were ready if we had to. Did you guys you guys didn't have weasel support at all? No, no. Okay. Um, was there a, how often was a was a C-130 taken out by a SAM? Or was it was it something that was? Because early on in the war, obviously they lost a lot of aircraft. Fighters. Right, right, right. Um, there's, there's a number of C-130s, uh, you know, a number of battles, but uh, that night uh, we were the only one. Uh, so, you know, uh, flying C-130s throughout the, the Vietnam War could be at certain places and times a, a high-risk venture, but, uh, but I didn't personally know anybody who, uh, who'd uh, lost their lives uh, on a 130. Now, you guys crash landed, is that correct? No, no. We, we landed in fine. Okay. Uh, we went over and uh, dropped off uh, that Blue 82 bomb, and then we were just taxiing back. And it was as, as on the taxiway when we started seeing these, these artillery shells come in. And, and, and one hit, like I was saying, 30 yards in front of us as we were taxiing. Uh, and in matter of fact, the, the pilot's initial reaction when he saw these things coming was to take off right there on the, on the taxiway, not, not go over to the runway, but just right on the taxiway take off. Um, but the flight engineer said we didn't have, t uh, ha didn't have sufficient runway to make it. Uh, so um, he was instead going to taxi straight ahead, go onto the runway, and then take off. And we never made it that far. So we, we got hit. And once, once we had uh, shrapnel go up in the wing and fuel coming out, we knew we weren't going to be able to, to get anywhere. And the plane that you guys got into, that point you made it out fine. Yeah, we made it out fine. Did I mean, you have anybody with you? Did you evacuate anybody at that point, or did you guys just get out? Did we what? On that airplane, mm -hmm. when you, you got on to, to leave, we, did you have anybody on the airplane that you were evacuating, or was it at that point we're just I think, I, yeah, I think the only folks that were on that aircraft were Air Force uh, folks. Matter of fact, I'm told that uh, um, after the plane had made it up, uh, 
they were given orders to go back and pick up the combat control team. Um, but at that point in time, they'd used up so much fuel, they didn't have the fuel to go back and make it, uh, and still make a return flight to Clark. So the combat control team that had, we'd left on the ground there, um, they made it out the next, uh, later on that day on the, on the helicopter evacuation. That aircraft was the last fixed wing out of Saigon. That, that yes. was the second aircraft that you got off. Yes, that's, okay. that's the last one. Now when you guys were landing picking up people, um, was there any, was, what kind of chaos was there? If any, with, with you know the people trying to get on, thinking maybe this is the last plane, we got to get on this thing. Or yeah, I don't. Early at that point? You know, I, I I don't recall frankly either one because to be orderly, there'd have to be a lot of people there, and I, and I think they'd pretty much all scattered by that time. So the only people I can recall are basically the crew and and the CCT and you know the folks that were right there in the party. How, how about before this when you were picking people up? Um, oh yeah, it. it it was orderly um, to a point. Uh, when I say orderly to a point, it, it was orderly. But as you can imagine, trying to, uh, to get 200 people uh, going up the ramp on the back end of a C-130, it, it's, a, it's a little bit disorganized. But we, we brought over two uh, uh, security police on each flight with M-16 and so on just for protection for the crew and so on. And, you know, it was, it was relatively calm. So, you know, up until that, that last minute, it was, I would say it was, it was orderly. And you guys didn't shut shut it down. You were you were hot the whole time on the on the on the taxiway. We we were until we were we were hot and rolling until uh, until the loadmaster said we'd been hit and we had fuel coming out and then we knew it didn't matter whether we were right. caught fire or not. We weren't going to go anywhere, so right. we had to shut it down at that point. So after that, you're the last fixed wing out of Saigon. What hap what happens then? What, where, where do you move from there? You're still flying support missions into other locations? Well, yeah, that, I, I, we were. We, uh, we continued to, to go over to Utapau uh, in Thailand and, and, and provide support to all the, uh, the bases over there that we had. So we flew what was called the Klong Hopper. A Klong is, is a river canal uh, in Thailand. So uh, the Klong Hopper was a nickname for the, the route that we took to going around all the military bases. Uh, one that would go around the country uh, clockwise one day and counterclockwise the next day and, and just delivering mail and supplies and so on. Continued to do that until um, uh, we backed out, we began to back out of, uh, of uh, Thailand and then I PCS'd out of uh, Clark uh, in 1979, excuse me, 1977. How old, were, how old were you while you were landing there? Gee, well, uh, fall of Saigon, I, I was born in 48, so uh, 26 years old. And from there, you PCS out. Where do you go from there? Um, yeah, PCS out, and uh, from there, I went to uh, uh, McCord Air Force Base, flew C 130s in the 62nd, spent a couple years there, then got an assignment down to Los Angeles Air Force Station, uh, Space and Missile Systems Division, uh, went into acquisition uh, there, spent four years there, uh, and then got an assignment uh, as a major back over to the Philippines again. So I went back to the Philippines and uh, commanded the uh, 374th TAC, uh, uh, ALSI, airlift control element, uh, as part of the 374th Tactical Airlift Wing. Um, back did, to Clark. And back to yeah. Clark. And then after that, I went back to Los Angeles Air Force Station for a second time, and then uh, after that, went to the Pentagon. So you retired? And then I retired out of the Pentagon, yes. Okay. What, uh, obviously you know now, there was a lot of um, protesting and a lot of things like that, you know, hatred towards the war, hatred towards the military thing, you know, during Vietnam. Right. And you saw some of that yeah. before you went in. Did you guys know any of that was going on when you were there? Was it something you guys thought about? Did you see it on the news? Um, you just kind of uh, separate yourself from all that. I, I think you had to be somewhat aware. I mean, you know, there was always this sort of, uh, I, I haven't frankly thought of this in, in many years, but I remember now that you bring it up, there were guys that were, you know, had gone out, I wasn't one of them, gone out and bought wigs just so that the civilians out there wouldn't see them with short hair and guess that they were military. Um, back you know, in the States. Yeah, back in the States. You know, I was over in the Philippines at the time uh, for, for most of this, so it wasn't so much of an issue there. The Filipinos were, were glad to have us. Uh, I do recall, uh, unfortunately, an event uh, years later um, when I was uh, at LA Air Force Station and I and some uh, fellow uh, officers out of the program office were just at, a, at an outdoor uh, restaurant uh, in Manhattan Beach, California, and uh, having lunch, and there's a couple 
young kids come by and yell out baby killers at us. So, you know, it was, uh, it was frustrating uh, to a degree, but I tried not to let it bother me. But uh, I think there was a, a lot of people, or I shouldn't say a lot of people, at least some people, people that were vocal enough, who at the time uh, had all the benefits and trappings of, uh, of, uh, of what the, uh, the, the military did for them, but didn't really appreciate it. What year would that have been, that incident you're talking about? Uh, I would guess that was probably uh, 19, uh, it was after 1979, so yeah, it was, it was well after the war was over, yeah. Now, I, I think that has pretty much changed today, but you know, even back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, uh, we, we still had that attitude, I think, about the military. Thank heavens it, it has changed a lot today. Um. And that was my follow-up question. That you, you see that attitudes have definitely changed. You know, I mean, there's still people that complain about what we're doing, and they'll always do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, but attitudes have definitely changed. You think compared to what what you guys experienced in Vietnam and coming home to what the soldiers today experience, definitely a lot a different. In uh, your in your opinion. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think challenging national policies is not a bad thing. Matter of fact, I think it's responsibility of every American to think uh, conscientiously about what their country's doing and how they want to, uh, to support it, challenge it, vote for it, vote against it, or so on. That having been said, people need to, in their own minds, separate out national policies and, and the politicians versus what we do to call upon veterans to serve our, our country. And, and, you know, when I was in uniform, I wasn't making any of those decisions. Uh, and if, if I'd lost my life on April 29th, 1975, it wasn't bec because of anything I chose to do or not chose to do. I was simply doing what I was being asked to do by, uh, by the, the U.S. military and, and be, uh, beyond that our civilian leaders. So I, I think, uh, I think the, uh, the population has come to more appreciate that distinction than it did back in the 70s. As you look back on it, has, has your experience there it changed you in any way, affected you in any way? Is it something you think about every day, or is it something that you, you know, that happened 30 years ago? I don't really think about it anymore. No, I, my, my experience in the fall of Saigon, I don't think, has changed me any. Uh, my experience in the military, I think, probably has. I, I uh, really appreciated the opportunity to serve. I, I value the years and time I put in and the, and the friendships that I was able to develop. Uh, serving overseas in the military is not like any other kind of duty I've ever had. I mean, it, you really develop a close bond and a family relationship with, with, uh, with uh, those you serve with, their families, and so on. Um, and that was, a, I think, a very powerful influence on, on me. I, I think uh, my sense of integrity and loyalty and so on has partly uh, come out of my membership in the, in the military. But uh, I, I don't know that it's... it's caused me other changes. So. No regrets, no... Absolutely no regrets. Done, do it again if you could. Absolutely do it all over again, yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, in uh, 2003, when we went into uh, Iraq, I, I looked at that and, you know, I said, you know, I'm, I'm getting up there a little bit old to serve. Uh, you know, I'm probably, uh, you know, I, not that I, I, I couldn't, but uh, didn't know that they would take me, but I, I went ahead and uh, inquired and uh, I put my hat in the ring uh, to serve in the Coalition Provisional Authority because by that time I had a lot of uh, management consulting experience uh, behind me and I ultimately went over to, uh, to serve as the Principal Finance Advisor for the Ministry of Transportation uh, in the Coalition Provisional Authority when we were basically responsible for the, uh, operating the country. Uh, and uh, in that capacity I was more or less the de facto CFO for a ministry of 40,000 people which in, the reason the ministry is so large it included uh, 10 state-owned enterprises such as Iraqi Airways, the ports, and, and so on. So, you know, that was another great opportunity. And, um, you know, there, the, whether, whether we went in for the right reasons or the wrong reasons, whether we've done the, the right things or the wrong things uh, to sustain that initial investment and so on is another discussion. But uh, I know in my heart that I, 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 at least for the time that I was there, I made a, a valuable contribution and have no regrets over that. So you were in Iraq as well? Yes. In 03? Uh, I was there uh, from January till September of 04. Okay. Any thoughts on that? You weren't active duty, obviously. No, I was, uh, I, was, uh, I was a senior executive service equivalent term appointee. So I was uh, 
appointed up to a term of 18 years, but really dependent upon the, uh, the needs of the government. Um, and uh, yeah, I've got mixed emotions on that, really. Um, I, uh, I was subsequently, in, in the interest of full disclosure, a Bush appointee. So, you know, I, I really think tremendously highly of uh, President Bush. Um, but whether he uh, had all the right, uh, right advisors and had the right information, I mean, it, it's so easy to second guess afterwards on weapons of mass destruction and so on. You know, when you're the person sitting on the hot seat having to make those decisions, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to second guess President Bush. And so, I, you know, given that we did go in, um, I thought that I could help. Uh, I've got a lot of uh, concerns over how we've handled it since then and in backing out and uh, in, uh, you know, when we've made such a strong investment in terms of lives and dollars and everything else to see where we are today in ISIS and ISIL and, and so on. Uh, I don't know how anyone can not uh, have concerns over that. So. Do you see a difference in the way we manage wars compared to Vietnam, as, as compared to what, how not necessarily today, but when you were in, in Iraq, in it, you know, ten years ago, is there is are we getting better at it? Um, I, I don't know that I've got the insight, nor have I served in the positions to say from a tactical and strategic focus that, focus that we're better or worse. Um, you know, I haven't been on the inside. Uh, since my Air Force days at a tactical level, when I was close provisional authority, that was more of a pure management job. Um, I don't think that we're getting better at it from the political perspective, but that is a you know that's totally separate from the military side. So, uh, and 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 how well we do or how poorly we do from the political perspective depends so much on who we have in office, not only in, in the White House but in Congress and so on. Uh, and so I I don't. Well, from how about from a, from a perspective, the military perspective, um, the way I, I know that your your hands are tied sometimes. You do what the politicians tell you to do. Right. But it seems to me that the way we manage the war, at least from the military, is, it changed a lot from Vietnam to up through the Gulf War and then up to the first the, the Iraq War to today. Um, a lot of people say that the war was managed better. The, the, the Gulf War uh, was managed a lot better than Vietnam was, and and maybe it's because the politicians are different that were running the yeah. show, I guess. Um, well, I, I think we've gotten smarter in fighting urban warfare, but then again, I think the nature of the war in, in Iraq was in the in, in where the threat was and so on was significantly different than uh, in Vietnam. It was less urban warfare in Vietnam and more out in the rice paddies in the fields and, and you know while you didn't have tanks out there it was much more of a conventional war in, in some respects than, than, than Iraq so you know again I I, uh, I, ju I just don't feel that I've got the insight to authoritatively comment on that I, d I don't know. Is there anything else that you want to talk about that we didn't address or? Um, this is your interview so. <laughs> well that's kind of you. That's kind of you. No, uh, Nothing that comes to mind, I, you know, I, in terms of, I, I will say that I, I, I'm proud of, of what we got accomplished in the fall of Saigon, and not so much, you know, the fact that we lost a plane over there, but we were bring, able to bring out so many Vietnamese who had, had served our country's interests so well for so many years, and they've become a very important part of our, our country and our economy and our culture today. And uh, so, you know, I have run into, over the last 20 years, uh, a number of, uh, of folks who came out in that airlift and who knows whether they were on the back end of one of my airplanes or not. So, you know, it, it's sort of heartwarming to know that uh, it's, I, th I think some really good came out of that. Um, you know, I, I would like at some point uh, perhaps to go back to, to, to Vietnam and, and, and see how it is today. Um, and, but uh, I'm glad that, you know, we were able to get some folks out of there and they became very productive U.S. citizens. Do you know how many trips into Saigon you made? You, you um, I, I, I don't recall for sure. I'm going to guess it was it was probably on the order of, uh, of a half a dozen or, or something like that. I, 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 I will just, one last thing I will say is, is that, you know, I'd already mentioned that I've been married two weeks uh, when, right. when, when I was hit. 
Um, but the, the strange thing is, and you just never know how these things work, or you know, if there's a, a bigger thing out there in the cosmos, but uh, at about three or four o'clock in the morning, uh, my wife says, uh, we'd, I'd bought this little uh, Jade Buddha as a souvenir from someplace in one of my travels. In the middle of the night, when she was in bed asleep, it fell off, off the shelf and broke his head <laughs> uh, off, the, off the thing. And it was right about the time that we were getting hit because it was like three or four o'clock in the morning. We got hit at four o'clock, uh, th three something in the morning uh, in, in uh, Saigon. So uh, it, it was just an eerie kind of a thing uh, to, to, to hear about. But, uh, you know, I, I just, uh, it's one of those things that uh, uh, you're glad to have had the experience, but you don't, you're glad you don't have to face it a second time. <laughs> Is there any uh, last question for you? I always yeah. wrap, I always ask this question. You know, somebody's going to watch this in 100 years or 150 <laughs> years. It might be your grandkids or your great great grandkids or something. Um, is there anything you want them to know about your service or the United States, you know, what we did back, you know, in Vietnam? Well, I wish I'd, I, I wish I'd have known you were going to ask this question before we started. I would have spent some time thinking of a really good answer. But, uh, you know, I, I just would say that I, I'm very proud to be an American. I'm proud to have served. Uh, I Not only do I have no regrets, but it's, a, it's probably uh, one of the highlights uh, of, of my life I'm, uh, in, 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 to me to, to have been had the opportunity. And uh, I salute those who uh, have came before me and who are follow me and are in the service now. I mean, our country would not be what it is today if it were not for our men and women in uniform. And so I'm simply honored to have had the opportunity to be a part of that. Well, great. Well, I, pre I appreciate your time. Uh, I appreciate your service, me personally, and, and Suzanne does as well. Um, I can tell you that my time in the Air Force, uh, although I didn't have combat like you did, was the greatest thing I ever did. Yeah. So. I, 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 know what you're, I know where you're coming from. Well, thank you very much, right. and thank you for your well, thank service. Thank you, sir. <laughs>